Welcome to today's Harvard Business Review webinar, The Visual Organization, Data Visualization, Big Data, and the Quest for Better Decisions. I'm Julia Kirby, Senior Editor at HBR, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I want to thank Teradata for making this discussion possible. We really want this to be an interactive webinar, so if you have questions or comments at any time, just click on that question icon in the lower right section of your screen and send those in, and we'll turn to them later in the hour. And we have a conversation going on at Twitter. You can find us at HBR Exchange. And if you're tweeting, please include the hashtag HBRWebinar. The era of big data has arrived, but most organizations are woefully unprepared. Some enterprises seem to act like big data is a passing fad, and others are simply overwhelmed and fail to recognize the real potential of these new channels of information. Amid all this hype and confusion, a new type of enterprise is emerging, the visual organization. How do you get there? Phil Simon is with us today to talk about the new deluge of data, the new generation of tools and visualization technologies, and the mindset that allows some organizations to focus on data discovery and exploration and not reporting that looks in the rear view mirror. These are the companies that are unleashing the power of big data to serve customers, change their processes, and gain a competitive advantage. Phil Simon is a technology expert who consults with organizations around strategy, data, and technology. And he's the award-winning author of six management books. He's the author most recently of the new book, The Visual Organization, Data Visualization, Big Data, and the Quest for better decisions. He's also a big Breaking Bad fan, and that's an interest that we'll talk about later in our discussion. Thanks for joining us today, Phil. I'm really looking forward to hearing this Julia, presentation. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start off by asking you a quick question. Oh, well, there's a quiz involved, a is bit. there? Okay. Who is this person? Uh, it's a CEO, right? Yes. This is Reed Hastings. He's yes. CEO and co founder of Netflix. And in previous books, like The Age of the Platform, I've discussed companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, all of which generate and consume a tremendous amount of information. I can make the argument, though, that there is no bigger big data company out there, though, than Netflix. And I don't want you to listen to me. I'd like you to actually look at some data here. Netflix currently sports about 48 million customers as of June 9, 2014. Its market cap is approximately $26 billion. And in my favorite statistic, Netflix is responsible for one-third of all US weeknight internet traffic. It's an astonishing number, and this is one of the reasons that net neutrality is becoming such a big deal. When I spoke at Netflix headquarters on my book tour a couple months ago, I actually mistakenly said that Netflix was responsible for one-fifth of the internet traffic. And probably 50 people immediately corrected me. So at Netflix, as we'll see, Data is very much a part of the culture. This isn't simply a departmental initiative. Data is like oxygen at Netflix. Here's some more facts about Netflix. It is currently the single biggest customer of Amazon Web Services, AWS, a business that's by some accounts $5 billion a year and growing around 50% a year. As a result of that, Netflix need not spend billions of dollars on building its own data centers when, in fact, it can rent them from Amazon. However, relying upon Amazon Web Services can be a bit of a double-edged sword. And in Christmas of 2012, many people had the unfortunate task of having to speak to their families because Netflix was down. In reality, the issue had nothing to do with Netflix per se. There was a very technical issue on the Amazon end that prevented people from watching movies. Now, as people are often want to do these days, they wound up taking to Twitter and Netflix hashtag fail was, was trending. It really had nothing to do with um, Amazon Web Services. Now, Amazon tends to, fo um, just to say Netflix tends to focus on different things like producing quality content. In fact, in September of 2013, Netflix became the first non-TV network to win an Emmy for House of Cards with Kevin Spacey. They're also getting into other original program like Orange is the New Black, which I believe just premiered its second season. So it's doing things differently than many other companies out there, one of which is using data, and we'll talk about that in a bit. 
Over the course of researching data visualization and big data for my last few books, I came across a fascinating credo at Netflix on how they use data. Because when you think about what Netflix is able to do, the obvious question to me is how? And I stumbled up a part, a com, upon this three-part data credo at Netflix, the first part of which is that data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. Uh, it's a very democratic organization. Netflix tends to share things with most of its employees. That doesn't mean that employee salaries are posted on the wall, but at Netflix, you don't have to go to the IT department to request information. Uh, data flows through the organization. And not just internally, but when they're looking at what their customers are doing, Netflix understands what each customer clicks on, when it pauses, when it resumes, when it stops. It knows the precise points at which customers leave certain movies. And on the basis of that, Netflix can serve up better content. And that's a really key point. Data isn't just some experiment at Netflix. When you think about Netflix's core business model, it's a lot like something like Salesforce.com. This is not AT&T or Verizon with a two-year contract, where even if you don't like it, you can't get out of it. At Netflix, you stay for as long as you like. And you're going to like it as long as they can serve up relevant content. Now, with so many different shows, how do they provide the right content to you at the right time? How do they learn more about you? Well, much like Amazon, they are constantly honing their algorithms in on individual people because you and I probably have different interests in movies. But forget staying within the, en within the enterprise and focusing on just customer data. Netflix does two other things that I think many intelligent organizations are starting to do, one of which is the company purchases an extensive amount of third-party data and metadata, which is simply data about data, from global information management firms like Nielsen. In other words, even though it's responsible for a third of all U.S. weeknight internet traffic, Netflix wants more data. So it buys that data, it purchases it from data brokers. In fact, Netflix realizes that even that isn't sufficient. Uh, you may have heard of Ray Kurzweil, a futurist. Well, he's made a lot of predictions about artificial intelligence, and many of his predictions have been right. I actually saw him speak a couple months ago in Las Vegas, and I like to think I know a thing or two about technology, but he's forgotten more than I will ever know. Netflix understands that, at present, computers and algorithms can only do so much. Netflix pays people to watch movies, but this isn't simply a matter of having you watch a movie and going, did you like it or not? They'll train you for several days to make sure that you're evaluating movie based on objective criteria. Netflix understands that computers and data can only do so much. So aside from collecting everything it can, it purchases data and it pays people to generate more data. And as a result of the way that it uses data, Netflix moves way beyond simple genres. Aside from Breaking Bad, which we'll talk more about a bit, I'm a big fan of Arrested Development. Note the orange cover here, which is a comedy. Um, dramas, westerns, documentaries, those are all very basic genres, and they lend themselves to different subgenres. Soon after the book came out, I became aware of research done, and was published in The Hollywood Reporter, that Netflix can take its data and generate 77,000 different subgenres of movies, and that number keeps growing. And some of the examples, I think, are pretty interesting. Dark, suspenseful sci-fi horror movies, pretty specific. Not to be confused with gritty, suspenseful revenge westerns or romantic Indian crime dramas. I don't even know what one of those would be. <laughs> but there's more than one of them, however, Evidently, it's whatever plural. it is. <laughs> uh, evil kid horror movies, I, I think those would fall under the Chucky movies. Oh, yeah, I movies. can think of a few of those. Uh, visually striking, goofy action and adventure films, and then finally, and this is a mouthful, violent, suspenseful action and adventure films from the 1980s, which begs the question, does the, the same subgenre exist from the 1970s? So Netflix can find exactly the movies that appeal to you, and we're going to see in a little bit how it can go even deeper than that. The second part of this three-part Netflix credo is that the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. I'd argue that never has it been more important to see what's trending, what's happening now in your business, but most organizations don't have the tools to do that. But Netflix has an incredible understanding of its customers in real time. For instance, Netflix knows that if this data is put in front of people, in theory they can make better business decisions. This is incredibly important because at Netflix, Again, you're not tied into it. If the content isn't germane, then you can wind up leaving. Uh, Netflix can do things simply that no other company can do. Now, do you happen to know who this is? Uh, what is the actor's name? Uh, of course, I know that he's from Breaking Bad. Right. 
This is Brian Cranston, and, uh, who plays course. Walter White on Breaking Blanky Bad. I actually just saw the play mm -hmm. uh, all the way. He plays Lyndon B. Johnson on Broadway last night here in the city. Right. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. But on Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston plays Walter White. And for those of you not familiar with the show, Walter White is a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher. And he finds out that he has terminal lung cancer. He has a pregnant wife. His son is 16 years old and has cerebral palsy. And he's given six months to a year to live. Well, what do you do if you have an acute knowledge of chemistry and nothing to lose? Well, you start manufacturing crystal meth. It's my favorite show of all time, and people like me are very uh, passionate about the show. Um, I've had many conversations with people about the show. Now, I'm talking about Breaking Bad because Netflix understands when it makes decisions, in theory, who's going to be watching these shows. And if not, it will adopt its algorithms. And one of my favorite stats on Breaking Bad is that 50,000 Netflix subscribers watched all 13 episodes of season four the day before season five premiered. 13 episodes, 42, 43 minutes each, that's 10 hours of what they would call binge viewing. Remember, when Netflix puts out original content, they don't make you wait and come back week after week. If you want to sign up, watch Orange is the New Black, all 13 or 15 episodes, you can certainly do that. Now, Netflix knew that 50,000 people watched all 13 episodes, but this isn't just about Breaking Bad. Um, in fact, uh, Ted Sarandos serves as Netflix's chief content officer. Now, I, I tend to think that a lot of organizations, and I write about this in the book, have a little bit of title inflation, right? We're seeing a lot of new chief ex officers. Well, at Netflix, Ted Sarandos serves as the chief content officer. Now, that may sound like a bit of a fluffy title, but in fact, it's a very important one because if you look at Netflix's financials, the company spends billions of dollars on content creation and or content acquisition. So it's in a very important role. And because Netflix model is essentially all you can eat, if you want to stream 24 hours of content a day, go right ahead. There's a real danger of people going, oh, I want to see House of Cards. I'm going to subscribe, binge view a day, and then quit and only pay my eight or nine dollars. And when they asked Sarandos this in an interview a couple of months ago, aren't you afraid of that? Isn't that a threat to your business model? He said, only 8,000 of our customers have done that with regard to House of Cards. Now, 8,000 is a big number. I don't have 8,000 customers, and I would suspect that many companies out there today don't. However, 8,000 on top of 48 million is a rounding error. So the point is Netflix is tracking everything that customers are doing. The third part of the Netflix credo, and certainly the most germane to the book, is that whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. Mine is not a book about neurology or the human brain. I'm not qualified to write that book. But in doing research, I discovered that the human brain was able to comprehend information anywhere from 60 to 60,000 times faster if it's been visualized. And I want to talk a little bit about visualization within the context of one of my other favorite actors, and if you happen to know who this is. Okay, so. Um, I'm terrible at this. I know him so well. Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey, yes. And he's in four <laughs> very different films here. Uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, one of my yes. five favorites. Uh, he won the Oscar for Supporting Actor uh, in The Usual Suspects. He plays a serial killer in the movie Seven, directed by David Fincher, and I'll come back to that in a bit. And then he won the Oscar for Lead Actor in American Beauty, great films. Mm -hmm. His current project is House of Cards, and Netflix developed this. It was a BBC show, but they remade it for America with Spacey pay, playing Kevin, um, I'm sorry, Frank Underhill. Netflix spent $100 million on this. Now, in traditional Hollywood settings, I've been told there are pilots, and many pilots don't get picked up. Now, Netflix spent $100 million to do this, employing David Fincher as a director for two of the episodes without even seeing a pilot. Netflix felt like it had enough data on its customers yeah. to justify that decision. It doesn't mean that there isn't risk associated with making this or that big data eliminates risk, but we can quantify that risk. We can get our arms around it. And for Netflix, spending that kind of money was, in fact, worth the risk. Netflix has the data to justify that type of expenditure. Now, I'm bringing up Kevin Spacey here because here's the cover for House of Cards. And if you look at it, Kevin Spacey looks incredibly authoritative. He's a 50-something white guy. He's got on a black suit and a white shirt. Right? It's got a white... Um, set of, of titles here um, for the uh, letters. Now, contrast that with the title for Macbeth with Patrick Stewart. Now, Stewart has a little less hair, but he's also wearing a white shirt. He's also around the same age, and there's also some red in there. Now, these are fairly similar types of shows, 
season one of House of Cards, I haven't seen season two yet, is very Machiavellian. It's about power, and, and so is Macbeth. Now, how similar, though, are these titles? the cover imagery. Well, in fact, Netflix created tools that quantify precisely what colors are in each and to what extent they're similar. So when we talk about how similar tastes are there for, say, a subgenre, well, you might have a penchant for red dramas, but for comedies, you don't care what colors they are. And that may be different than myself. I know that I just happen to like orange. I like Arrested Development, as I mentioned before, because it's a funny show. Maybe I have some associ association with the color orange. The point is that Netflix can quantify even something to some people as amorphous as cover imagery. They can quantify it very precisely and then use that as part of their algorithm. If you look at Arrested Development, the color breakdown here is very different than House of Cards or Hemlock Grove, but there is still is a little black in Arrested Development. So Netflix looks at everything and says, can we collect data on it? And can we use that data to move our needle? Again, you're not locked into Netflix. They have an incentive to make the recommendations as germane as possible. And this begs the question, what exactly does Netflix know about each of its 48 million streaming customers? First of all, Netflix knows what you watch. It also knows when you watch. This is very different than 1998 when Netflix started. Remember, back then, Broadband was not nearly as pervasive. We didn't have iPads and tablets as we know it. There were cell phones, but they couldn't handle video over the networks back then. Well, now we know exactly when you're dialing up a streaming service, and eventually DVDs by mail will go away. When Hastings started the company, it's interesting to note, he didn't call it DVD by Nailflix. Right? He called it Netflix. The ultimate goal was dis to disrupt the DVD mail order business and replace it with something that saves them, if nothing else, a great deal on postage and broken and lost disks. So that was the goal. N data is core to their model. And even though Netflix in the DVD service would know what it sent you, it wouldn't know if you watched it or when you paused. Netflix can tell you precisely that information with streaming services. Interestingly enough, Netflix also knows the device on which you're watching. This isn't a matter of 1998 or 1990 or even 2005 in which people were maybe watching Netflix content on a laptop or a desktop or a DVD player. Now you've got Xboxes and tablets and iPhones and all sorts of different devices, hundreds of different devices. And maybe you watch different types of content on different types of devices. Maybe Netflix can infer that you have children because you're watching cartoons on an Xbox, whereas you're watching other types of movies on a traditional laptop or tablet. So Netflix can make all sorts of assumptions about what would appeal to you and keep you as a subscriber. And again, Netflix knows when you're pausing and when you resume. Are there certain points of movies that appeal to you more? I mentioned before with House of Cards, David Fincher, who directed Fight Club, a great movie, directed the first two episodes of House of Cards. Netflix would market to different customers based on that fact. In other words, if you loved Fight Club and Netflix was trying to justify its expenditure of $100 million for House of Cards, then you'd probably get ads with the words directed by David Fincher. If you didn't like Fight Club or never heard of Fight Club, maybe you like, for lack of a better term, chick flicks. Maybe you'd see more of Robin Wright, who's also in the show. So again, it's the same um, content, but it's marketed in a very different way based on the fact that certain levers are going to work for you that may not work for me. So one size certainly doesn't fit all, as I write in the book. This era of big data allows companies like Amazon, like Netflix, like some of the other ones, to segment customers and keep them coming back. Another example of a really interested, uh, interesting data visualization comes from a company called Autodesk. And a great um, story comes from uh, an employee by the name of Justin Macheka, who works in Canada. And he was playing around with visualizing employee movement through the organization. By way of background, in my consulting life, I have written thousands of reports for companies. And many of them told me exactly one thing, how many employees were leaving, what's the attrition rate, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Justin Majega from Autodesk, which has about 7,000, 8,000 employees, took a very different approach to this. And over roughly a four-year period, he created an absolutely astonishing data visualization that shows movement within the company. And I want to show it to you today. Uh, this looks like it's something from space. But in fact, this is at the center of the CEO. And these are pockets of the organization that are moving around. Now, this doesn't necessarily lend itself to oh, I've got a problem here. But if you see a lot of the movement on the left-hand side of the screen, you might go, well, why, why is that happening? Is it a reorg? Is there a cultural issue? Do you expect there to be more 
movement in a part of the organization because let's say it's customer service and you don't pay people as much and it has a, I used to work as a customer service rep people scream at you all day it's not the most fun job so to me this is the type of tool that promotes something really key data discovery we don't necessarily know what we're looking for uh, we want to see what's going on we want to examine our data beyond a simple dashboard or KPI where we're very much looking for one thing we so one thing that that you write in the book that I think is a, a great way of thinking about it is that sometimes the uh, often the the real rationale for the data visualization is not to answer a question but to allow people to ask new questions sure you can't tell me that at Netflix Julia someone said I bet you if we quantify the colors on the imagery for the covers that we will get an eight percent um, retention bump or that the ROI will be 12 percent and they certainly at Netflix didn't purchase that software from an office mask ma uh, max Netflix built that software because they believe in the power of data and if they were wrong if there was no correlation between certain types of colors and certain types of customer decisions then that's not necessarily a failure on Netflix's part they believe very strongly as I pointed out in the credo that data matters the default there is to do something with it uh, one of the quotes from the books is from uh, James Barkdale. If we have data, let's use data. If we have opinions, let's use mine. And that's very prevalent at these visual organizations that are discussed in the book. So these are just a couple of the examples from the book. And I want to take it up a little bit of a level and talk about some of the characteristics of a visual organization. First up, they eschew this notion of set it and forget it. Back in 2004, I did some consulting for a utility company in New Jersey, where I was living at the time. And make a long story short, I created a tool that took data from one part of the system, massaged it, and loaded it into another. The process is called ex Extract, Transform, and Load, or ETL. It wasn't terribly sophisticated, but that's what they hired me to do. Five years after that, they called me back and said, hey, Phil, we're going through a massive system upgrade. We like what you did last time. Can you come back? Sure. So I go back. I recognize a few familiar faces. And this woman's squinting at me. And I'm squinting back. And I know you. Hi. Nice to see you again. And I look at her desk. And she has this tool on her screen. And I go, gosh, that looks really familiar. You've got great design sensibility. And she started laughing and said, you don't remember. You built this for us. I said, oh, OK. Does it still work? She goes, yes. And I said, did you change it? I just told you it still worked. Five years so, later. Right. My point is, in this era of big data, there are so many new streams of information coming at us faster than ever. We can't capture all of them, but I think that it's very dangerous to assume that something that worked five years will necessarily work today. Again, if you're just trying to move data around, that's one thing. But if you're really trying to understand your customers, why they're doing things, why they're not doing things, your employees for the same, I think that it's very dangerous to just say, we're going to set it and forget it. These organizations also encourage data exploration and discovery, as I mentioned before with Netflix. You can't tell me that they knew in advance that this was going to matter, but they decided that it was worth taking that type of a chance. Along the same lines, these companies are creating really new and interesting tools. It doesn't mean that they don't use Microsoft Excel, they don't rely upon dashboards to make certain decisions, but Excel, as much as I like it, is fundamentally in an accounting application. It does not encourage discovery to the same extent that some of these tools that can handle petabytes of unstructured data can. So it doesn't mean that you have to get rid of all those tools, um, I run a very small business myself. My P&L pretty much tells me where my business is going. But unfortunately, I'm not Malcolm Gladwell. I don't sell enough books to qualify as big data, maybe someday. Um, these companies also are buying and building new tools as necessary. Um, in many cases, they don't have the expertise, but they're not afraid to go out and rent it. In one of the HBR pieces that I wrote on a company called Carvana, they use the site called Kaggle that effectively lets you rent data scientists. So even if the uh, people watching are from small organizations that may not have the resources, um, we have never before lived in an era in which it is easier to date before you get married or to rent before you buy. Um, there are also a lot of myths about data visualization, uh, one of which is that we must visualize all of the data. I think that's simply nonsense. We're never going to get all of the data. And in many instances, I believe that's an excuse because people don't want to embrace new ways of thinking or learn new tools. You're never going to have all the data. Five, six years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data from, say, LinkedIn or Facebook, and then a few years after that, Twitter. And then all of a sudden, Pinterest comes out. And many people start saying, I'm still struggling with this other stuff. Now I have to worry about Pinterest. Well, maybe, maybe not. If you look at Pinterest's engagement numbers, and forget its valuation of $10 billion. Pinterest may be something worth considering. So again, this notion that you're going to have all the data, I think, um, is pretty much um, a myth. It's also important 
to not just visualize good data. I would argue that one of the easiest ways to identify if you have an outlier is to visualize it. Right? I've seen my own um, business and doing consulting, I've, I've thrown together very simple data visualizations and said, what's going on here? Yes, I could have sorted this spreadsheet and then drilled around, but as I said before, if you can visualize something, often you can see something wrong or something interesting much more quickly. Um, and even though you're visualizing the data, it doesn't mean it necessarily will point to the right decision or the right action. There still may be a need to have a discussion about why something is happening. You know, Steve Jobs would never look at data. He was uh, fervently against focus groups. What's the Henry Ford quote? If you ask customers what they want, they'll tell you, a, um, is it a bigger horse or something like that? So um, it's important not to over-rely upon visualization. Um, there's also this myth that it will lead to certainty, and there are many ways uh, to manipulate it. There's a great book called Drunk Tank Pink that I read a couple months ago, and it's all about subtle design ways that you could allow people to make or point them in a certain direction. Um, it's not very difficult to manipulate data. In fact, when I first read uh, Edward Tufte's book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, when I was 19 at college, I remember how easily you could take a stock that was really volatile, change the x and the y axes, and make it look relatively stable, and of course, vice versa. So there still can be manipulation involved. Just because it's visualized doesn't mean that the conversation ends. But I do think that data, and data viz in particular, can certainly further a conversation about a particularly vexing business issue. I'd like to move now to some lessons on becoming a visual organization. And you probably recognize the guy in the picture again. OK. Who is it? It's Walter White again. Oh, of when course. When he was still teaching chemistry and not <laughs> uh, making math. Then, then. Don't but, recognize um, him without his um, meth costume. Right. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the lessons here to be gleaned, and then I'm sure we'll have time for some questions. Uh, one of which it's important to look outside of the enterprise. Again, there's tremendous value in enterprise resource planning, ERP, and or customer relationship management systems, CRM. Those are still very important. But I would argue that there's tremendous data to be gained, tremendous value to be gained from data from open data sources, from linked data sources. It isn't just about looking inside the enterprise. Again, going back to Netflix, Netflix is purchasing third-party data and metadata. It's paying people to generate more data. Um, it realizes that it doesn't have enough. So only looking internally, I think, can only get you so far. Don't get me wrong, you can get a lot of value out of looking at relational databases and structured data. I certainly have in my career. Uh, but these days, that only tells part of the story. Researching my last book, Too Big to Ignore, I discovered that only about 15% of all data out there is what they call structured. And by that, I mean it plays nice with Excel and relational databases. By that, I mean a, a list of customers, a list of sales, a list of transactions. Those are cer still certainly very relevant. But if you look at podcasts, if you look at blog posts, if you look at tweets, unstructured data that doesn't, YouTube videos, Instagram photos, Pinterest pins. That's all data, the vast majority of which may actually be noise, but around 85% of the data generated today is, those, is of that unstructured variety. So just looking inside the organization at relational databases and tables, I think, can only get you so far. It's also important not to forget about the metadata. I know that geeks around the world like me Never thought that we'd ever hear President Obama utter the word metadata. But after the NSA and PRISM scandal wrote, the government would say, we're not collecting the data, we're collecting the metadata. Well, some people would argue that there really isn't a distinction. In other words, if the government wasn't listening to your call, then maybe it just knows the person whom you were calling and the time and the number and the date. That actually is very valuable information. A three, three or four months ago, I saw that a Stanford grad student had looked at some of the metadata the government had been collecting. And there were two calls that a woman, I believe, in California had placed to a family planning center. These weren't wrong numbers because the call was for 20 minutes. If you meant to order a pizza and you call an abortion clinic, you're probably going to figure that out pretty quickly. But if you call twice, well, you can make the assumption that the person was thinking of having an abortion. So metadata can be incredibly important. If you look at, say, photos on something like Flickr or Instagram, the, the metadata, the time, the date, the tags, those can all be exceptionally valuable pieces of information. You should not ignore the metadata. Netflix doesn't. It's also important to visualize both the small and the big data. By big, I mean the, the structured stuff, the unstructured stuff, external to the organization, some of the things I mentioned before. But let's not forget about small data. 
again, think of the two as complements, not substitutes. I think that you can go very far with one or the other. If you can use big data and visualize it to understand your customers, that's great. But if you don't understand who your customers are, i.e. the small data, that's kind of a problem. It's also important to walk before you run. Um, this is not the first talk I've given on the book, even though it's only been out for a couple of months. And I realized early on that when I talked about what Netflix was doing, or in previous books, what Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google doing, some people were a little intimidated. My gosh, Google knows this about me, or Amazon knows. They keep recommending things. In fact, a couple months ago, Jeff Bezos and Amazon filed a patent for, and I'm not making this up, anticipatory commerce. In other words, they're going to send you things, or at least have them in a warehouse, before you've ordered them, based on purchasing patterns. And when you talk about that, sometimes people get a little scared. Well, our organization isn't nearly that size. That's OK. Amazon, Netflix, Google can all do things today that they couldn't do five years ago or 10 years ago. And in five years, th the same will be true. So it's important to recognize this is not a sprint. This is not about setting it and forgetting it, as I mentioned before. Um, it's very possible, and in the book, there's a, a framework on becoming a visual organization. It's a four-level framework to make a long story short. The point is, you can graduate to different levels. Netflix didn't become Netflix overnight. Um, so that's um, important to know. You're not going to go from zero to Google overnight. It's also important to embrace the user experience. When Justin Majeka from Org, Org Chart, the tool that I showed before, was developing his tool, he didn't do it in a vacuum. He did not sit down and go, OK, what makes sense to me? He iterated. He showed people different versions of it. He said, what works for you? OK, then I will build it. Right. Very much a lean startup methodology of throwing out what they would call a minimal viable product from the Eric Reese book. Then people would play with it and say, this is confusing. I don't understand this. Or, hey, could it do that? That way they felt like they were involved in the process. And when the tool was ultimately deployed throughout the organization, people were more likely to use it. My first book is called Why New Systems Fail. And something like 70% of IT projects failed in the sense that they went over budget went past their deadline, didn't give users the desired functionality or all of the above. Well, why is that? There are a lot of reasons. But in many cases, the people didn't want the technology or they blew off training. And then when we went live, all right, how do I do payroll now? That's kind of a problem. So involving people from the beginning is a really good idea. It's also important to experiment. There isn't necessarily a linear path. Again, with org org chart, there were times in which Justin said, oh, I was on the wrong path. Uh, I need to refine this. I, I'm not going to go from A to B to C to D. I may go from A to B back to A again. So it's important to understand that it's not necessarily a linear process. And as I mentioned before, with new data sources, you may have to alter your tool in some way to take into account new data that may, in fact, be important. Again, it's important to walk before you run. When I think about organizations that want to get going, yeah, we want to do what Netflix does. We want to do what Google does. OK, well, I want to dunk a basketball, but I can barely uh, touch the net. <laughs> so I am not going to do that right off the bat. You're going to have to evolve into it. Um, it's also important to avoid what I call the quarterly visualization mentality. And by that, I mean far too many organizations enable their employees to only present data at a quarterly meeting or an annual meeting. And I think that's still very important, right, if you're giving a talk on the state of your organization or to investors. But in visual organizations, they are constantly interacting with data. They're try trying to understand what's going on in their business. And it's important for them to be familiar with these tools. I've spent many hours consulting and training clients, and then they wouldn't use the tool. And then it was go time. Yeah, Phil, how do we do that again? So it's important to encourage people to play with data and then not just make it a, a routine thing in the organization as opposed to these always being sort of these one off visualizations where. Uh, a lot of energy goes into it, and then there's maybe a decision results. Right, and that's it. These are interactive tools. One of the points I make in the book is that a static data viz can only get you so far. Right? If it's a simple pie chart, which is sometimes fine. Uh, for some of my speaking gigs, I will put together a very simple pie chart of my audience, because it's a one-time thing. But imagine if I could collect data in real time about who was interested in what I was saying and potentially alter that. There are technologies now that can assess whether people are staying in the room. Or you could just look around and see which people are actually looking up or looking down at their, their tablets. So interactivity, I think, is a really key uh, piece of becoming a visual organization, as is transparency. In the book, I write about the University of Texas and their system, which is comprised of 11 different schools and I believe one hospital, makes its 
data available to not just students or alumni or administrators or employees, but anybody with an internet connection code can go to the University of Texas Productivity Dashboard. And if you want to see admission rates for minorities in the engineering department master's program or how long it takes them to graduate, knock yourself out. They believe in being transparent. Stuart Brand said in 1972 that all information wants to be free. Again, at Netflix, they don't let everyone know everyone else's salary, but the goal is to share information. Far too many organizations, and I've read many posts about this on the HBR blog, are into the information hoarding business. There's even a term that I love, security by silo. In other words, the organization is less susceptible to a hack because the data is put in all these little silos or fiefdoms. The downside of that is it becomes extremely difficult to get a 180 degree view of your customer or of your employee. One of the reasons I got to be very good at manipulating data is that when I worked in HR, the data was all over the place. And unless I figured out how to stitch it all together, um, I wouldn't have a job. So it's sort of like that, that famous uh, uh, military quote, uh, a ship is safest in its harbor, but that is not what ships are meant to do. It's sort of uh, data is safest in its silo, but that is not what data is meant to do. You're fixing, if, I hadn't heard that expression before, but in, in golf, if you have a slice and you take a really strong grip, you're trying to fix a problem by causing another one. So yes, I agree with that. Again, all data is not required to begin. Companies understand that. I wish I could predict the future, but there will be new sources of data, new websites, new types, and not just structured and unstructured, but there's even semi-structured data. So something like an email. It's structured in the sense that you have subject and time and date and recipient. But there's also a lot of a blob in there, right? Text. Or you have an attachment. So it's semi-structured. Again, there are all sorts of different types of data. And as a general rule, it's better to visualize it. But if you think that you're going to pick the 10 sources that matter, and then 10 years, those will still be the 10 that matter, I would bet you that you're wrong. Again, it's important to encourage interactivity. There's nothing wrong with, with static data visualizations, but I would argue that they do not promote data discovery. When I was showing the org org chart video a little while ago, it may not have prompted you to take a particular action. But there might have been something in there that made you go, wait a minute, what's up with this? Well, Justin Majeka built the tool such that you can pause, you can rewind, you can drill down, you can go forward. So it's almost like a time series type of thing. And that's very important because when you think about the way that most organizations, I would argue today, still manage their data, the line of business employee in finance or payroll or HR or whatever has to ask for data from the IT department. Well, what happens if you forgot something? You have to resubmit a request. And the IT doesn't necessarily know the business, and many pure techies will write to spec. You ask them for X, they're going to give you X. Well, what if you wanted X, but you really meant something like X or X plus Y? So in this era of constant deluge of information, it is very important to encourage employees to play with data. And in some cases, you might have to hire new employees. You might have to stress the importance of data, maybe send them to training. Um, there are plenty of new tools out there. Fortunately, in this era of open source software, cloud computing and software as a service, this isn't 1998. You don't need to spend millions of dollars and have consultants there for two or three years before you actually got to use it. There are many ways now of seeing software and playing with it, and even in some cases loading data on a trial basis or with the freemium model. You maybe not, don't get all the extra features. There's a company called Data Hero that works on the free. I've been playing around with that software. Just as a freemium model, I'm able to create simple tools. Um, if I had more robust needs, then I would certainly pay for it. So there are all sorts of ways to explore it. Don't feel like you need to spend millions of dollars before you get going if you're going to see any kind of result. It's also important, I think, to iterate. Um, the final product may not be what you're currently working on. It's important to understand that. Um, requirements tend to get missed when people are collecting them. That's one of the reasons that we've seen a much more of an adoption of agile methods versus waterfall methods. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in a waterfall method, you're really going in a methodical, linear way. The challenge with that is that if you forget one requirement and you go live, fixing that requirement could be exponentially more expensive versus an agile method, in which case you're building a prototype, you're throwing it against the wall, you're telling people, look, it's not perfect, but what do you think? Does it work for you? And before we turn it over some questions, I just want to mention one other tip that I think is really important. Many people watching today are probably thinking, well, what's the ROI going to be? And the short answer, I think, is we don't know. Uh, there's simply no way to know what it's going to be. And I think the problem with many people, and I've read many books about this and spoken about this many times, 
that we want certainty, right? We have big data, we've got all this data, how can I quantify my risk? Coming full circle here back to Netflix, again, you can't tell me that Netflix knew that House of Cards, forget winning an Emmy, but would become so critically acclaimed and have so many subscribers. I simply don't think that you could proactively, even potentially retroactively, attempt to assess the ROI. Either your organization believes in data or it doesn't. That doesn't mean that you have a blank check, doesn't mean that you're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars or something from the get-go. Companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook are obviously making multi-billion dollar bets on where the future is going to be. They absolutely could be wrong. But as Clayton Christensen has pointed out with the innovator's dilemma, there is a real danger in pretending that the world is going to be the same in five years and dismissing new technologies and, I would add, new data sources. So it's important to be curious as an employee, but also as an organization. As uh, Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can deploy all the fancy tools in the world. If your organization doesn't appreciate the value of data, if they're not willing to look at things from a new perspective, then I think that can be very dangerous. Uh, for one company for which I used to work, and we'll turn it over to questions in a second, forget big data, I an analyzed how we were spending our money on recruiting. Should we go to the Ivy League or not? And to make a long story short, the company was spending four or $500,000 to get a single applicant, and then the salary, and that person was staying for a year and a half, versus a state school, we're spending a fraction of that, and that employee lasted for a much longer period of time. When I presented that to the head of recruiting, my answer was simply, but I like recruiting there. That's fine, but then don't ask the question. I think that the, the days of making decisions purely based on gut are slowly coming to an end. More and more, we're going to be able to quantify things, and that starts with data. It's important, I think, in summation, to look at data visualization as the front end of big data. Most people are not going to go into Hadoop and all sorts of distributed file systems and write code. You're trying to build tools for the average business user to make better decisions. And hopefully, the webinar today and the book can help in that regard. Thank you so much. That was a rich uh, amount of material to start engaging with. Um, so let's turn to some questions. I mean, I guess the, the, the very first one is, let's say you're that, um, that business leader, CEO level, C-suite, who, um, who's got the religion, says, I really want to make this more of a routine thing in my organization, not just that, we're, that we believe in data, but that we present it visually and make it accessible to more people. Um, where would you start? Is there a certain kind of natural point in organizations? Right here. <laughs> start with the book, of course. Um, but is, uh, would, would you go to the marketers? Would you go to the, um, the human resources people and say, look, you've got the data. Let's start with you. Or what, what would be your advice on that at a generic right. level? At a generic level, I think that you certainly can come from the top down, but I also think that you can go from the bottom up. Are there particular employees, groups, departments that have been um, hankering for this type of access? Are they constantly being told you can't do that? They're, they're really hungry for data. Uh, to me, that's probably the more important question than, well, I guess we should always start with sales or we should always start with HR. Generally speaking, based on my own personal experience, the financial people tend to be better than, with numbers than the HR people. But I've also met, and I was one of them, very tech and data savvy people who loved playing with data. So rather than starting with a function arbitrarily, unless there was some sort of compelling business need if you're launching a new product, for instance, I think that looking at which parts of your organization have generally played better with new tools and have been asking for more access are probably the ones to start with as opposed to the ones when you said, hey, we deployed this new business intelligence tool, and they said, that's okay, we just like using Excel. I'd probably start with the former group rather than the latter one. Yeah, so go where the energy is and, and, and let it run with it. I'm now, a big believer that there are three types of people in this world at a high level. There are the ones that get it, present company included, and hopefully some of you out there. There are also the people who don't get it but want to get it, and I can absolutely work with those people. My landscaper had a website that was built 15 years ago. When he came over to take care of my home, I pointed out that his website could use improvement. And he said, I agree. So he knocked a couple thousand dollars off the price, and I built him a very nice website. He came over six months later with a book about WordPress, which is a content management system that runs one out of every five. I love that, the fact that he wanted to learn. Then there are the third group of people, and I try to avoid them, those that don't get it, and then the, those want to get it, They'll never get it. Those are really dangerous because nothing's going to, I think, come out of that. Ideally, you can turn that second group into that first group, but avoiding the people who absolutely hate data, what I call the data phobes, is probably a good starting point. 
So you use that great Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, so what about culture? How, what, what helps you move the needle on culture, specifically regarding turning into a visual organization? I'd say that culture is really a function of, of many things, but it starts with people. Which people are you hiring? Uh, if you look at Google, I just pointed out before that HR people tend not to be very tech and data savvy. That's not the case at Google. Uh, there was a great, I think it was actually an HBR piece by Laszlo Bach on Google and HR, and they run HR like a people business. For example, it's very intuitive for many HR professionals to say, we want people with a college degree, or we want people with a good grade point average. Well, Google's run the numbers. They said, for certain positions, yes, that correlates with success. Promotions, tenure with the company, performance. For other positions, though, we know that that does not correlate. In other words, if you're hiring for a programmer, you might want someone who dropped out of school. Even though that seems totally intuitive, the point is that Google is willing to look at the data to make that determination. Now, some could say that Google looks at data too much, and there are many examples of employees who've quit. There were designers. So they stopped split testing or looking at data on everything. I want to develop something. So there's probably a limit there, but I would argue that all organizations are a function of people. And if, at the senior level, if they don't understand the importance of data, even if you have, I think, very capable employees, that could be a recipe for destruction. Um, higher, better, I'd say, and that includes at the top. Now, right now, people who can do great visualization of data are pretty rare birds. So when you hire some of these people into the organization, one thing that you say in the book you shouldn't do is put them all in one department, kind of, um, I don't know, cloister them away from the rest of the organization. Right. Talk about why that's a mistake. Well, Julie, I think it's a mistake for a couple of reasons. First, I think that it cements boundaries. And in reality, all or people in an organization really ought to be making decisions, at least in some part, based upon information. Um, at Google, at Netflix, at Amazon, data really does rule the day. Beyond that, though, think about the era in which we're living. You can create a website now without knowing a lick of code. The tools have become so much more, forget less expensive, so much more user friendly. If you can drag and you can drop, you can utilize some of these tools and create other ones. Absolutely. If you're creating something like org org chart that Justin Majeka did, that does take a level of technical sophistication. But most people don't need to create something. They need to know how to use it. But the tools have become so much more democratic, you absolutely do not have to be a coder to use these tools and make decisions on them. I'd feel very differently if you needed to roll up your sleeves and type in code. OK, question about training. You mentioned um, you know, maybe you need to train people very broadly. Not, not, now we're not talking about these data viz gurus, but the just uh, rank and file, the people that you want to be engaging with um, the visualized data. How would you go about, what, what would be Job one for training. Well, you could certainly purchase a tool and deploy it and make people go to training. That's been the met methodology in a lot of organizations. Um, but because there's been such a proliferation of open source and cloud-based tools, ones on the freemium model, it's also not a bad idea to take a look at what employees in the organization are already using. For example, it wouldn't be terribly difficult to see how many people are using something like, uh, like a Tableau. And if a decent number of people in the organization are using it, maybe others just don't know about it yet. So I'm big on communication. And if you see something that people are using, and I go back 15 years ago to when I first started working in corporate IT, I made a lot of friends because I was walking by the desk. I'm sorry to bother you, but what is that? And then this energy, to use your term, will hopefully build within the organization. Um, there are certain people who are always going to find reasons to get out of training because it takes them away from their real job. If you explain to them, though, and hold people accountable for their real job involving data, involving analyzing tool um, information that you can't just do in Excel, then I think maybe training might go a little bit better. Okay, how about some, some downsides? You spoke earlier about um, the fact that we, uh, our brains are kind of wired to, um, to go straight to the visual, and we take in that information so much faster than if we're presented with prose, text, or something. Um, but on the other hand, it's probably easier to sort of get us to go down the wrong path by a bad visualization. Mm -hmm. Is that, how much of a danger is that? I think that's a, legit, a legitimate danger, but so is Google, right? If you Google something and you happen to click on the wrong site, then you're walking away with 
in theory, bad information. Um, so critical thinking, I would argue, is still very important. Just because something's been visualized doesn't, as I mentioned before, mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's telling the entire story. Um, it's a real danger, I think, if you say, well, the data has told me to do it. Um, you hopefully still have a head on your shoulders. So you, at one point, were in human resources, as you've mentioned, and it was maybe a little frustrating because you were very data-oriented and as a kind of as a rule, the profession wasn't. Um, let's say you went into that kind of organization today, <laughs> Fortune 50, now you're head of HR. <laughs> what would you do to turn it into at least that department, maybe not the entire organization, but at least that HR department, what, what, are the, like the what, what would be your top three priorities to change it into a visual organization? Well, to me, HR is an all-encompassing term. And if you go back to the Mad Men days, you have the personnel department that's really there to make sure that policies are enforced. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to visualize sexual harassment. That could probably get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but the, the analytical type of work, I think, would be very important. So you probably can split people into, uh, say, open enrollment. If that's your job to process forms, uh, there may be some benefit from visualization. But I, I don't think that everybody needs the deep analytical skills that would help you, you identify which employees were actually moving the needle. Um, I would, based on my experience, uh, take a look at its internal systems and the way that the organization tracks data. Is it in one central place internally, forget the external stuff for a moment, or do you have a bunch of standalone spreadsheets and databases and lists? If that's the case, that needs to be consolidated. You need uh, priority number two or number three. You need to have that master employee record. I need to know that John makes $6 an hour or whatever in every system as opposed to, well, it's six here and it's eight there. Which is it? Well, getting into the deeper analytics, as I mentioned before, is very difficult if you don't have basic information on people. And I'd argue the same thing is true outside of HR, but even with employees. Uh, Tony Fisher, a friend of mine, wrote a book called The Data Asset. And in it, he cites the statistic that most organizations need about two weeks to pull together a comprehensive and accurate list of their customers. Two weeks these days? So if it takes you that long, again, employee skills are important. But if the infrastructure is in place, if the culture isn't in place, then I think that employees who do like to do things with technology and data may wind up bolting because they're constantly fighting this uphill battle. How can I do deeper level analytics when I don't know how many people work here? That's kind of a disconnect. Um, the the uh, cases that you went into depth on today um, were really data intensive companies. You could say their whole business model is very based on, on data to start with. Is that Are those the only kinds of organizations that be can become visual organizations, or what other? Are there some kind of real low-tech companies that you've seen do amazing things with, with uh, visualization? Sure. Again, you don't have to be this size of, of Google, uh, Julia. As I mentioned before, there are plenty of tools out there. There, uh, uh, sites like Visually have really cool infographics. In fact, in the book, I mentioned um, a 11-person design firm called Lemonly. They're based in North Dakota. Now, their business is design, but they're an 11-person company. They're anything but a big company. And they created, it wasn't interactive, but it was a PDF of their annual report with really cool visuals showing the breakdowns of different industries, different geographies, breaking down revenue percentage. I thought that was a really cool way. Uh, it's not a data intensive company in the sense that they generate a lot of data. They might, their clients might give them a lot of data. But again, uh, to me, you can take creative pockets of the organization and do cool things, even if there are other larger, potentially more powerful pockets that don't get it yet. Um, one thing that you talk about in the book is the, the um, Amazon Author Services, mm -hmm. or I can't remember what it's called, but they're... Author Central. And that, I think, it has to be the ultimate um, data visualization company, where you get to the point where not only are you using it for your internal decision makers, right. but you're even making it uh, accessible to people outside the walls of your organization. Yes and no. Uh, Amazon hides the individual record detail, and for good reason. Think about it. If I knew who bought my, you know, there's this dispute now between Amazon and Hachette pulling the books. Well, if the Hachette people and the Amazon authors knew who bought their books, they could circumvent Amazon. So Amazon tells me at an aggregate level, hey, Phil, you're selling more books in San Francisco than you are in Omaha, Nebraska. And on the basis of just that aggregate information, which is very easy to see, 
I can pay more for a Google keyword because that's probably where I'm going to find a bigger audience than in Omaha, Nebraska. Even though it may be cheaper, no one's buying my books there. So it's, I agree with you, they're creating tools not just for their employees, but then they're turning around. And they're not alone. LinkedIn redesigned its um, UI recently and it made it more visual. Facebook now, if you manage a Facebook page, it'll give you visualized graphs. Twitter, in the book I write about, um, a company called Visually that Yahoo recently acquired, lets you, within a few clicks, visualize your tweets so I can see which ones of my tweets over time trend more towards hashtag breaking bad versus hashtag big data. I didn't have to throw that into Excel. I didn't have to do a lot of data manipulation. Um, visually just told me what. So yes, there's no shortage of tools. And one of the things I recommend to people is start to play around with some of the different tools out there. Again, you don't have to purchase something and two years later, you see it. Many times, forget a product demo, you can actually download, play with, and interact with some of these tools long before you've cut a check. Now you talked about the kind of the folly of the ROI obsession, that a lot of times when you have a new capability and you're starting to experiment in something, you can just kill it if you demand an, an, some kind of clear ROI. But um, how can you start to build that excitement in the organization for you know, the payoff in some way? Like, What if you had one uh, really great visualization um, exercise that happened and led to a great decision? Then, how do you make the organization aware of that? How do you celebrate I'm it? big on communication. I'm big on celebrating uh, little victories. I'm also big on over-delivering and under-promising. For example, when you think about ROI calculations, oh, we, some vendor says, oh, we're going to sell this to you, and the ROI is going to be 87%. Well, let's say that it's only 80. That's a failure, right? Well, what if you throw it out there and say, we think it's going to help, but we don't know? The other problem, I think, with the RI calculation is that it looks and things in isolation. If your market share is 34% and you deploy a tool, and then afterward it's 32% a year later, well, who's to say that your competition stood still? The world changes. Phil Rosenweg is a friend of mine. He wrote a great book called The Halo Effect, and it's about delusions of business and how we think that we can hold everything constant. This is not a Petri dish. This is not chemistry from Breaking Bad. This is the real world, and there are many, many factors at play. Even if you can predict something reasonably well one year, like Google did with Google Flu Trends, it did it much better than the CDC. Two years later, Flu Trends was off. So that doesn't mean that Google Flu Trends isn't a useful tool. It just means that, again, something that works now may not work then. So if that's true with one tool, how can you possibly isolate ROI? But to answer your question, I'm big on communicating victories, even if they're small ones, not to mention encouraging people to play with this stuff, even though there may not be a precisely defined ROI. I just, I just think that it's a very dangerous road to go down because you can still be successful, but yet people feel bad about it. Well, listen, I, I wish I could get to more questions, um, but I, it looks like we're out of time here. This has just been a great presentation. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And of course, I want to thank our sponsor, Teradata, for making this possible. Um, this concludes our presentation. And have a great day.